and you fly a tie, you tie a flag just like that. Is that what you do? You don't have to cut them open anymore. We don't. You use, you use a thing called a throat pump. Oh, okay, fine. You squirt some water in and suck that, suck it out, and then you push, oh. grease that stuff in a little dish, and you see what they've been eating. Okay. <laughs> and and I don't have to tie those flies because I got gazillions of boxes of flies. You just got to figure out what it is they're eating today. Oh, is that right? Okay. <laughs> What's on the menu? <laughs> wow. For my birthday, about five years ago in April, I decided I wanted uh, to um, take a fly fishing course. Oh, no, so I, I took it at Camosun College. Uh, we fly fished on the lawn. Uh, there was not a fish in sight, not no water <laughs> in sight. Yes. But I perfected my fly fishing You're casting. Casting. Wow, there you go. <laughs> It's harder than it looks, isn't it? It's harder than it looks, absolutely. Well, I, I've been- No, it I've, looks hard. I've been learning how to cast a two-handed rod, which is uh, developed in England on the Spey River many, many years ago. Why two hands? <laughs> um, because you're using a very long rod. Uh, my typical fly rod would be about nine foot. Mm -hmm. the, the one that I have for Spey is uh, 13 and a half. You and and, and you have longer. huge, you have a huge mechanical advantage when you do this. Oh, yeah. It uh, lets you get a lot more distance. And the reason I took it up was so that I could cast flies from the beach when the fish are a little too far out for a single-handed rod. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm learning. In my age, I'm taking up something new, and it's been fun. I wish I'd learned ten years ago. Good for you, Dave. Have you, you ever heard of a guy named John Robson? No, don't uh, develop a theory of the fishing rod that no. revolutionized the uh, industry in Great Britain. When was this? Uh, in the probably in the seventies. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. He John Robson was is a, a physicist. He was my supervisor. Oh yeah, and he. Uh, he made one of the most important physics discoveries that's been made in Canada, which was to measure the lifetime of the neutron. Mm. Very famous guy. He became the head of department at the University of Ottawa and then at McGill. And what but was his his passion was, was fishing. And he thought, you know, it should be possible to, to figure out how to make a fishing rod that really worked in an optimal way. So he set his mind to it and he did it. Huh? Yeah, there's been a lot of, uh, with the advent in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, when they started moving to composite materials from mm -hmm. bamboo. Uh, first were the, were the carbon, so were the glass, fiberglass rods. And they were, they were still kind of like bamboo and most of them designed them like, like bamboo rods. Uh, and you're right, they weren't the easiest things in the world to cast. Then we moved to composite materials, uh, graphite primarily. And there's a guy by the name of Gary Loomis who really got into that. He worked for NASA in, in building composite materials for the space program. And he went out on his own and started up a fly fishing company. And that from there, things kind of took off. He, they got into a lot of this very sophisticated design of, of fly rod materials. How about that? And rods like less than, well, about a third of the weight of original bamboo rod and twice the power. Uh, mm -hmm. Quite a quite a revolution. Mm -hmm. So to make a fishing rod, you either have to be a rocket scientist or a particle physicist. Something <laughs> like that, yeah. <laughs> The, it helps. Good, good observation, Randy. The physics and the dynamics are quite intriguing. I, I'm sure that would keep a physicist going for a while to figure out those things. How do you work out the, the fish? What's hmm? that, Jim? I catch any fish. Did you yes. catch any fish? I've caught lots of fish over the years. <laughs> Learning, learning, see, learning new things on the coast because uh, fishing on the west coast is different from fishing in Alberta, particularly if you're fishing the east slopes. 
Uh, you're going from fishing for little wee arctic grayling that are sort of like six inches long and on little creeks to uh, throwing stuff at 20 pound salmon. Yes. <laughs> That's a whole different fishing. ball game. I was thinking that it's real fish out here, but you know, you said it first. Well, some of the toughest fishing I ever had was <laughs> west of Calgary on a place called Quirk Creek. It's a tributary to the Elbow River. And the, the local trout guys, uh, trout, trout club was trying to figure with the Department of Fisheries, was trying to figure out a way of reducing the population of the non-native brook trout in, in this particular stream. They see if they could do it by angling pressure. So you do a fish identification test so you could recognize uh, a brook trout from the local uh, uh, char uh, trout. And then they'd put you a place on the stream and, and try to catch these fish. Well, I spent a whole day and I covered my section of stream and I caught six fish. Each one of them was no more than six and a half inches long. <laughs> and each one, each one was from my hands and knees behind a bush because they were spooky as hell. <laughs> and that's some of the toughest fly fishing I ever had. <laughs> Okay, uh, well, Happy New Year, everyone. <laughs> uh, thanks for the fish stories, Dave. Yeah. And um, we've got 27 people signed up uh, so far. And one of those is Matt Taylor, who's uh, speaking tonight. Thanks, Matt, for uh, joining us. We'll get to you in a little bit. Uh, we can start off with uh, some announcements, and but we'll uh, get to you fairly soon, I think. So. Uh, uh, I think that uh, we'll we'll get underway. Uh, Chris, is it okay for me to share the screen? Yes, it is. Okay, so what I'm going to try and do here is can anybody see that? We can. Yep. 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 We see it. Okay. So uh, what we'll do is. I will shrink some of these screens down here. Can't, I can't get at it. Let's see. As soon as I move my cursor, it, it covers up the thing I want to click. So that's great. So what we'll do is uh, start with our slideshow. And uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to our monthly meeting. And uh, we start with some announcements. And then our guest speaker, Dr. Matt Taylor from uh, Hertzberg uh, will be, uh, he's got a great title, Judge Me By My Size, Do You? Tales of the little, Littlest Galaxies That Could. And uh, then we're gonna have a, uh, 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 a showing of uh, the new book, Not Yet Imagined. And if there's time, uh, a little bit of a summary of the virtual Astro Cafe web, uh, which is pretty quiet these days, in part, I think, due to the uh, fairly reliable cloud cover that has uh, blocked us from doing too much exciting things. So um, the first person I'll speak is uh, Reg, and he's got some exciting news to the people who were not at the council meeting. Uh, the Victoria Center is purchasing a Takahashi 130 millimeter refractor. And um, let me tell you a little bit about it. The uh, aperture is 130 millimeters. The focal length is 1,000 uh, millimeters. It's an F7.7 uh, uh, scope. The words TOA stand for Takahashi orthogonal apochromatic uh, refractor. And so it has a, an objective lens with three lenses made of very high quality, uh, extremely low dispersion glass, which uh, min minimizes the chromatic uh, aberration. And uh, it's a typical price uh, uh, on the website where we have a store credit, uh, o OTP, I should say, not OTA. Um, uh, it, uh, uh, oh yeah, for, pardon me, uh, the OPT price uh, for the optical tube assembly um, plus accessories 
would be around $10,000 Canadian. Um, when a survey was sent out kindly by Joe Carr, um, Mike Krapotic, who's a Victoria Centre rascal uh, living in the Port Alberni area, he approached us and he said, I've got a lightly used uh, tack for $3,800 Canadian. This is well below the market value of that instrument. And uh, Mike was uh, keen for the Victoria Centre to use it because uh, in part, he would give him a great deal of satisfaction if he saw images that were taken with this scope up on uh, our Zenfolio site. So we're really uh, grateful for him coming forward. So last week we had a council meeting and we showed them this, uh, this uh, listing here. So what we will be getting is the tube, a finder, a finder bracket, a cradle and a tube holder. And um, uh, here's some details with it. Uh, it comes, uh, this particular model comes with a fairly uh, different type of focuser that's more optimized for visual astronomy. Uh, we want to replace that with an existing focuser that we uh, acquired when we had the TPO scope and uh, we can uh, uh, adapt that to this. Um, here's another picture of it uh, together. And uh, look at that, uh, Mike bought uh, the uh, 2000, 2021 calendar. So if anybody wants to get a calendar, uh, please contact Chris Purse or Lori. I think they both have at least uh, five each. So uh, they're going for a good price and they're a, a great uh, thing to have in your observatory or uh, give them to your friends. They'll love it as well. So there you go there. And uh, this is the lens of it. The Mike is the original owner of this scope. He, he got it, uh, I, I guess, around uh, 2010 or thereabouts. And he's used it a, probably less than 20 times. So it's in mint condition. And uh, he comes in a nice uh, box for uh, transporting it. And what it's going to do is attach to this uh, Lozmandy D width bar on the top of our optical guidance system uh, uh, refractor that is currently attached to the um, uh, the uh, power. What, what do we call that? Uh, the oh, like a senior moment here. The, the wonderful mount that we have up on the observatory. It'll come to me in a second. At any rate, we need some the additional equipment. We have the uh, very high quality feather touch um, focuser, and there is an adapter uh, that is uh, made to attach this to the Takahashi. Um, and there's also, um, we'll probably be wanting to get telescope rings to um, securely attach this to the um, uh, Lozmandy plates because it'll reduce any vibration or torsion as we uh, track the scope over the night. And we might be uh, getting a, a, a tack flat, flattener or a focal reducer as well. And they're running around $1,100 US for those. So we currently have a, a credit at OPT for $5,560 US. And if we got all of these goodies here, it would reduce it down to 4,120 US for, for that credit. If we can buy these parts through OPT and they are a vendor for all of these uh, particular items. So that might work well. So uh, during the pandemic then, although we couldn't get up to the observatory, we have managed to install the a 12.5 inch uh, research grade uh, Ritchie Krejcian telescope made by optical guidance system on the Paramount mount. Paramount is the word I was looking for. And uh, coming soon, we will be able to attach uh, uh, world-class uh, uh, top of the line refractor uh, to the mount. And uh, we also have the 20 inch uh, Obsession Dobsonian scope and we're waiting for uh, a little bit of easing in the uh, COVID regulations and, and uh, a bit of an ease up on the monsoon that has been plaguing us. And then we'll be able to put 
Argo Navish dig digital setting circles uh, on that scope, which will really help make it much easier for people to find uh, objects on the obsession. So we're going to have a really uh, quality optical setup there as soon as the um, the uh, uh, basically uh, uh, when we open up again, uh, we're going to be all set, I think, to uh, have a very effective uh, uh, Victoria Center Observatory. I'm really looking forward to it. And uh, so that's that uh, talk. Um, so that's all from the president. Uh, Vice President Randy, do you have any uh, news for us? Uh, no news. No news. But uh, this is the first time that I'm seeing it in black and white. What, what do you mean? That, that, that Vice President Randy, that's... Oh, oh I see. It's, it's certified, Randy. You... <laughs> There's no way you can escape us now. No going back now. <laughs> uh, uh, second Vice President Margie, do you have anything? Nothing to report. Okay. Is Bruce on? Bruce uh, Lane, Sky News Editor? No? Okay, uh, Bruce is working on a, the next step is the January issue of Sky News, and he estimates that it might be ready by middle of uh, January. So we'll look forward to that. They're always interesting and entertaining. Uh, the treasurer, Deb, are you on? Well, Deb's not on, so I, I put some calculations in there. This was our balance at the uh, council meeting on the 5th of, October, of January and uh, $12,639. Um, but uh, if we spend the $3,800 from the uh, treasurer uh, from the, for the scope, it'll reduce our balance down to just under $9,000 in cash Canadian. Plus we have the $4,000 credit uh, if we get all of that stuff for the OPT um, and that's in US funds. So uh, we're in a fairly healthy situation there. So moving along membership, Chris, have you got anything to add? Sure, I can uh, mention a few things. So our current membership is uh, 267 members. Um, in the pre-pandemic world, we were um, closing in on 290 members and we did suffer a drop, I think that maxed out at about uh, down 40 members and we're about halfway back again. So we're, our membership numbers are slowly uh, creeping back up again. So that's good to see. As Reg uh, mentioned, uh, Lori and I both have some calendars available, $15 each. Uh, please email if um, you are interested. And with my past president hat on, reminder that we have um, our annual general meeting next month. We are still seeking some nominations for both um, center awards and center council members. Um, particularly, we've been looking for um, a nominee for president, vice president, um, a national representative, um, an outreach chair, and a librarian, and we, we have had three uh, nominations for, uh, the, for those five positions. We have not had a nomination yet for a vice president, the first vice president, or for um, a national representative. <coughs> those are the current vacancies. Thanks, Reg. Okay, thanks, Chris. And uh, uh, it, with great sadness, Randy will likely be vacating his vice president position fairly soon. So uh, I encourage people to seriously consider this. It's uh, a great opportunity to get to know a, a terrific group of interesting and and talented people even more. So uh, please, uh, please uh, consider it. And it's a way to uh, uh, possibly help influence, move the club in the direction you would like it to go. So uh, having said that, uh, uh, school program, Sid and or Lori. Oh, thanks, Ledge. Uh, school program this year has been quite sluggish compared to last year's. Uh, this year, so far, we have had eight uh, events compared to um, 43 events last year. And uh, last year, we had Galileo moments about 900. 
compared to 150 this year. So it has been slow, but it's coming along quite well. So uh, hopefully uh, we will improve these numbers and uh, otherwise uh, fine. Okay, well, thanks, Sid. And uh, I understand that some of your influence of your school video presentations is extending off the island and you're invading the lower mainland as well. So good on that. Yeah, we sure are doing that. Yeah, we are going tomorrow. They're going to be in Langley School. Uh, we and uh, then up island. Yeah. Great. Is, is Lori on tonight? I haven't seen her name yet. No. Oh, okay. No. Very good. Well, good work on that, uh, uh, Sid. Appreciate that. Is uh, Matt uh, here with a technical committee report? I don't believe so. Okay, thank you. And a website, uh, Joe? Well, I guess the first thing is uh, to thank everyone for the um, um, answering the survey, the Victoria Center Observatory survey that uh, was posted over the holiday season. Uh, we had 60 responses from members, so that was great. Thanks very much. And uh, I think the uh, Technical committee report was ably covered by Reg. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Joe. And thanks for setting up that survey. It was Joe's first survey, and I think it really worked well. I really appreciate it. Is uh, Nelson Walker on? Haven't seen his name. Okay. And I haven't seen Bill either yet. Okay. So maybe if they join us later, uh, the National Council will. Uh, we'll uh, get them to uh, provide some input then. So having said that, um, the uh, first thing here is that uh, uh, we're gonna have a presentation with Dr. Uh, Matt Taylor. And uh, I'm not gonna go into details of Matt's uh, background because it's a, a terrific uh, human interest story in his own and I don't wanna uh, spare ruin any of the thunder. So I'm not going to do that, but uh, this is a very interesting uh, um, presentation. I saw an advanced uh, showing of this at the UVic open house, and I really am looking forward to uh, Matt's uh, presentation. I will say that uh, he is a uh, postdoc from the uh, her, at the Hertzberg Institute right now, but I won't say any more than that. Um, before we get after Matt, we're going to be have hopefully maybe have a talk with uh, Victoria Center's very own uh, Chris Gaynor, who is the author of a new publication about the Hubble Bay Space Telescope that was released this weekend. And uh, you can freely download it, and I encourage you to do so. Um, a, a bound copy, which I'll probably be looking forward to getting later uh, and hopefully getting Chris to sign for me, um, uh, will come out. And uh, uh, it's a beautiful book and, and it'll be even nicer, I think, having a, a hard copy of it. So uh, we'll try and get to that after um, uh, Matt's talk. So uh, with that, I'm going to end the slideshow here. And I'm going to stop the share. And uh, how are you doing, Matt? Are you ready to go? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the uh, very kind introduction. Okay, uh, you're hope welcome. You didn't, uh, hope you didn't oversell at all. I hope I uh, uh, leave everyone wanting more. But um, yeah, thanks for for having me, everyone. Um, it's it's a pleasure to be here, and it's uh, that's a fantastic turnout. Um, I was not expecting this many people, so it's it's great to see so many. So many faces on the screen. Um, so without further ado, I'll try sharing my screen here and see how it works. There we go. Can we all see that? Yes, no? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, um, yeah so my, my name is uh, Matt Taylor. Um, uh, like Reg said, I'm a, a postdoc here at HAA in Victoria. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit tonight um, about uh, my favorite type of galaxy, which are dwarf galaxies. 
Um, so I'm just flashing this image here. Uh, this is from the, the Millennium 2 simulation. Um, and it's just sort of supposed to uh, sort of illustrate this general idea of how um, these, these big, beautiful galaxies kind of form um, as far as we kind of understand now, where, where we see these, these massive elliptical galaxies and they're, they're built really from smaller building blocks. So small galaxies gather together, create slightly larger galaxies, and then they eventually merge. And slowly but surely throughout cosmic time, we, we end up with these, these giant galaxies that we all uh, ooh and awe at, at these, these fantastic images from, from Hubble, from ground base. I mean, it's, we, all, we all know how spectacular some of these galaxies are. But as, as great as these are, um, I'm hoping that maybe by the end of this presentation, um, I might convince you that uh, the, the dwarf galaxies, the, the diminutive little um, uh, underappreciated galaxies might, uh, might deserve a little, bit more, a little bit more attention. So that's, uh, that's kind of the goal of, of my presentation. So, so we'll, um, we'll see if we can get there. So as Reg uh, indicated, um, uh, I do have a little bit of a background uh, contribution here where um, for these kind of informal talks, I like to, to make sure that there's some context um, uh, for, for me. It might make the, the presentation a bit more interesting and, and, uh, and you can get to know me a little bit more. Um, I grew up on Vancouver Island uh, up in, in the Comox Valley. Um, I went to school there, grew up my, my entire uh, um, early days were, were in Courtney, did all my schooling there. Um, but uh, unlike a lot of people at the end of high school, um, I really had no clue uh, what I wanted to do with myself um, and had very little pressure about where, where, uh, where to take my life. So uh, after high school, I took a year off and um, worked at this, this old store I'm sure many of you remember called Zeller's. Um, and so I worked there for a year after high school and then decided to pursue one of my passions, which was uh, at the time cooking. So I went to uh, the professional uh, cooking school at what was known at the time uh, uh, as Malaspina in Nanaimo and emerged from there and eventually moved down to Victoria and started my uh, professional cooking career, um, which you can see here. This is uh, this is a very rare photo of, of me in these days, of course, before smartphones and before uh, ubiquitous pictures of everything everywhere. So, you know, one of these old school film cameras. But nonetheless, um, here I am in, uh, in, in my cooking career. This is actually taken at um, Hatley Castle, uh, uh, catering for, a, I think it was a, a Chinese delegate or something. It was a really fancy, fancy meal going on. And so this is, this is me training to be, to be a chef. Um, however, after a number of years, uh, while I still loved cooking, um, the, the industry is quite hard and, uh, and quite tiring, and I just couldn't quite see myself retiring after 30 years of, of doing this. So I, I went back to university um, to pursue another of my passions, which is, um, as you might expect, uh, astronomy. So I enrolled at Camosun, um, 2000, it was actually 2005 when I enrolled and just kind of worked and studied for the first couple of years and, uh, and switched to UVic in 2007 um, and eventually graduated from there in uh, 2011 after getting some research experience again right here in, in Victoria at, it, uh, at HIA, I guess at the time. Um, and so after graduating from UVic, um, I took up uh, my grad school at uh, Universidad Católica Oh, right. Um, yeah, that was my conv convocation day. And that's not actually what I remember about that day. It's, uh, it's actually this sad story. So I'm sorry for any Canucks fans. There's uh, a bit of trauma there. Um, but yeah, that was actually the day of my convocation when they lost in game seven. It was, it was quite tragic. But, you know, let's, let's just remember the convocation, right? So anyway, um, after UVic, uh, I made my way down to Chile uh, to do my grad studies, where I was lucky enough to go to some of the uh, some of the great observatories down there. So here's a, a couple of pictures. Um, this, uh, this top one here um, is at the VLT. That's, that's ESO's VLT. Um, and this bottom picture here was actually the night before uh, I took two nights worth of data uh, using the Blanco telescope. And that actually formed the, the basis of my PhD thesis. Uh, so I spent two years at Universidad Católica, and then the final two years of my PhD I spent at, uh, at the ESO offices in, in Santiago. 
And uh, after that, I briefly came home uh, before starting my first postdoc in, uh, in Hawaii, working with, uh, with the Gemini Observatory. Um, these were absolutely fantastic years. Um, I absolutely adored my time in Hilo, uh, learning about the telescope, supporting uh, Gemini operations, uh, doing my own research, and really, um, really the most rewarding part was uh, their outreach program. That's their, their flagship program called Journey Through the Universe. Um, and so this is where uh, a number of staff from the different observatories in Hawaii visit, uh, oh, I think it's up to three or 350 uh, uh, different uh, classrooms from K to 12, um, engineers, astronomers, um, you know, everyone from, from the industry going to these classrooms and, and reaching out to these kids. And it was, uh, it was really fantastic. So here's just a, uh, a picture with one of the classes that I just had a, a really fantastic time um, uh, talking about constellations and, uh, and how different cultures and everything view them. Um, and uh, anyway, after, after Hawaii, after a few years there, uh, I was lucky enough last December to uh, move back home again. It's, uh, it's a dream come true to actually be doing astronomy um, in my favorite place in the world and in my home. And, um, and so I'm, I'm really happy to, to be here and uh, share my story and share some of uh, my research and, um, and my, my favorite galaxies in, in astronomy. So without further ado, um, let's, uh, let's get in the mood to, to uh, learn a bit about galaxies and, and, uh, and discuss galaxies a little bit. And so uh, this is gonna be a little bit of our uh, audience participation. So feel free to take yourself off mute. Um, this is a little game I like to call So You Think You Can Galaxy. So I'm gonna start with a little warm up round here. And uh, I just want people to shout out whatever uh, picture A through F uh, that you think is not a galaxy. F. 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 Okay, I'm so happy to hear that because if I heard anything other than F, I would be really, really worried. Um, yes, you're absolutely correct. That is my cat. That is not, in fact, a galaxy. Um, although sometimes he thinks he's as, as important as a galaxy, but we love him anyway. Um, so let's move on to the next round. Let's, uh, this is a little bit harder here. So uh, once again, just shout out the letter that you do not think is a galaxy. B. A. Or a B, I hear an A. B. B. So those of you who said B, you are absolutely correct. Um, this is the only image in that, uh, in that mosaic that is not a galaxy. That's actually called uh, Hanny's Vorwerp, which is a whole other, uh, whole other topic and a whole other, uh, a whole other thing. Um, so moving on to another, another harder round here. Um, let's all just shout out uh, whichever letter do you, that you think is not a galaxy. F. B. F. I hear a B. It's it's a little bit harder, isn't it? B. 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 B looks like a planetary. <laughs> so in fact, it is D. Uh -huh. D is a globular oh, cluster. Um, wow. And oh, the yeah. rest are actually uh, galaxies. They're weird galaxies, but they are in fact uh, different types of galaxies and. Uh, galaxies like C, uh, C there is a dwarf galaxy, and so we'll we'll talk uh, a little bit more about galaxies like that uh, a little later. So one more round um, to keep it family friendly. This is the what the heck round, um, and uh, and I won't fault anyone if you can't quite figure it out. But uh, let's let's just shout out anyway. Which of these do you think is not a galaxy? <laughs> e. E. C. 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 They're all galaxies. <laughs> That's actually probably the closest uh, closest thing to a correct answer. It's a bit of a trick question. Uh, a through E are absolutely galaxies. Uh, C is a quasar, for those who, who are wondering. Um, it's so far away, it just looks like a star. Um, and F is one of these things that, uh, that I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, um, which may or may not be a galaxy. And this kind of depends on, on really who you ask. And so. Uh, Moving on, um, these are actually the three galaxies that I'm going to talk about uh, uh, tonight. So this is not these three specific ones, but these three types. So we have uh, what are called regular dwarf galaxies, dwarf elliptical galaxies. That's that's A. Uh, e is what we call an ultra faint dwarf galaxy. Believe it or not, there is actually a galaxy in that image. Um, in fact, almost the entire image 
is the galaxy, but it's so diffuse uh, that you, you really can't see it's there until you apply um, all sorts of processing and analysis to it, which you'll, you'll see a little later. And F is one of my favorite types uh, called an ultra compact dwarf galaxy. Uh, some people would be throwing their shoes at me right now and saying that they're just ultra compact dwarfs because it's debatable whether they're actually of galactic origin or not. And, um, and again, I'll, I'll touch on that in a little bit. So first of all, um, let's put these things in, uh, into a little bit more perspective by uh, just you know, looking at the scale of where these, dwar these dwarf galaxies reside. And so we'll start with um, what we all know and love is, is our solar system. Uh, and so zooming out from our solar system, um, here's our solar neighborhood, sort of uh, uh, a mock 3D kind of representation with, with all the stars that are, that are close to us. And as I'm sure all of you know, this is all embedded in, in our own galaxy. And so zooming out, um, we see kind of where we are located in our, our single galaxy. Um, and so all those local stars are, are roughly in that little tiny circle um, where um, I'm yelling, hi, mom. And so if we zoom out a little bit further, um, this is what uh, I'm sure many of you are, are aware of, what we, we know as the local group. And so this is dominated by our galaxy, the Milky Way, as well as the Andromeda galaxy, um, which I'm sure many of you have, have, have looked through uh, with telescopes, binoculars, or naked eye if it's dark enough. But interestingly, uh, over the last uh, 15 years or so, uh, the population of dwarf galaxies in the local group has absolutely exploded, um, in large part due to um, uh, Alan McConaughey, who is, uh, who is at HAA himself. Uh, and so the more we look, the more we find all of these really tiny galaxies uh, that numerically absolutely dominate the local group. Uh, which is expected based on cosmology, that if all the giant galaxies are built up from successive mergers of small galaxies, then you would expect many, many, many small galaxies for every giant galaxy. So sure enough, in the local group, this is what we're, we're starting to see. And so if you take this and then extrapolate it to even larger scales, we can look at the, the local volume. Uh, so here we are in the, the local galactic group here, and here's NGC 5128. Uh, this is near and dear to my heart. I wrote my thesis mostly on, on this galaxy, um, as well as, as nearby uh, galaxy groups, and in particular, these, these galaxy clusters. So I'm going to focus here on the Fornax galaxy cluster and the Virgo cluster. These are two of the most massive galaxy clusters uh, nearby to the local group, um, and they're, they're relevant for, for this talk. So, so remember these these names. But the point is, in all these galaxy groups that are dominated by these giant galaxies, you can imagine how many dwarf galaxies there must be if we have 30, 40, a few dozen dwarf galaxies just around our local group. Um, you can imagine the many hundreds and thousands of these dwarfs uh, spread out throughout all these, these galaxy clusters and, and groups. Uh, even more so if we take, you know, uh, another ridiculous step out to place our Virgo supercluster in the, the grand scheme of cosmology, where here's our, our local, uh, local group of superclusters. And then just because we can, we'll take one last step out. Um, and apparently, we all just live in a giant snow globe um, that masquerades as uh, a universe. But anyway, zooming back in, uh, we can look at these kind of this artist impression and start to compare it to what uh, cosmological simulations are telling us. And so this, the, this selection of panels that are sort of a successive zoom in going from the, from the upper left uh, here, sort of clockwise zooming back in to, uh, to a structure that shouldn't be that unlike our local group. And so you can think of this, this region of, of the universe and, and all these cosmic filaments feeding galaxies to these hubs, uh, building up these galaxy clusters and giant galaxies. Um, and as you zoom into these simulations, you start to see uh, that the simulated systems that are similar to the local group seem to have a lot more of these small dots than, uh, than we've actually observed in the local group. So the question is, uh, are the simulations wrong? Are they just predicting more of these, these dark matter halos, these, these low mass galaxies than are actually there? Or have we just not found the, the dwarf galaxies yet? Um, this is known as the, the missing satellite problem, which I could probably get myself into trouble by talking too much about. 
Um, but it just illustrates the, the importance of dwarf galaxies in understanding our own cosmology and our understanding how our universe actually forms. So even though they're, they're small, they really do play a critical role in informing us about how, how everything is, has come to be um, in terms of, of galaxy evolution. So I've said uh, that we're gonna focus on a couple of galaxy clusters. So let's, let's start with that and start actually diving into some, some real images here. So uh, I'm gonna zoom in here to the Fornax galaxy cluster. Uh, and this image here on the right is, uh, is real data. This is, uh, this is a, a U, G, and I uh, image. Uh, so the U, G, and I filters for, to make the RGB image taken from the uh, dark energy camera on the four meter Blanco telescope in, in Chile. Uh, this is what I use for my thesis, but um, uh, this is for a, a separate survey of, uh, of the Fornax galaxy cluster. And so what you see here um, all of the, the, the bright yellow galaxies here are in fact uh, giant elliptical galaxies. So these are the, the, the giant galaxies in the core. This is NGC 1399 for anyone that's interested. Um, and these are what are, are basically dominating the, the dynamics in the core of this cluster. And so among other scientific goals, uh, one of ours was to uh, search for dwarf galaxies, go really deep as, for, as deep as we could using this really fantastic wide field image um, uh, to give an idea, this, is, this image, single image, is uh, three square degrees um, of sky. Uh, so this is, you can imagine, like this is a really fantastic camera to do survey work. And so we, we took all these images, um, we actually scanned by eye uh, to look for dwarf galaxies given their kind of characteristic blue colors. And sure enough, uh, they were everywhere. Everywhere we looked in this image, we were finding dwarf galaxy after dwarf galaxy after dwarf galaxy. And so um, all the circles in this image are individual dwarfs. So the white were uh, dwarfs that, that were already known um, and the red were newly discovered in, in our survey. And so you can see that we really um, uh, made a tremendous uh, stride in, in doing a census of, of dwarf galaxies in the core of a nearby galaxy cluster. And so to, to zoom in on, on a little box here, um, give you an idea of what we were kind of looking for, uh, this, this box here is kind of zooming into this little section here. And just in this box alone, you can see this little blue smudge. I hope you're, you're, this will show up on your screens. Uh, there's another smudge here that we zoom in. Um, and then there's another one here, another one here. And so really everywhere we looked in the core of this galaxy cluster, we were finding uh, just hundreds of, of dwarf galaxies, which was really exciting. It wasn't surprising necessarily, but it was exciting to see that, that they really are uh, all over the place. And so what I'm showing in this, this upper right panel here is just kind of a more schematic look uh, at this same, this same footprint. Uh, but instead of just using circles, we're actually um, uh, using shapes to indicate the ellipticities of the dwarf galaxies. So we fit models to each of the dwarves to find how, how are these actually oriented in the, the galaxy cluster. Um, meanwhile, the, the colors are, the, are, um, are based on the brightness. So you can see it's going from, uh, minus 10 in absolute magnitude all the way to uh, minus 22 for the, the most massive giants. Um, and so they're, they're oriented all over the place, uh, which you might not expect if they're infalling um, in a kind of a structured way uh, that they might all be aligned with each other. But in fact, what we found is that they're, they're aligned in all sorts of ways, uh, uh, suggesting that they've really been tossed around uh, by the, the gravity of the, the giant galaxies. Um, and just, I mentioned how we, we, we modeled all these galaxies to fit the, uh, uh, the shapes and the morphologies of them. I thought I'd um, just give a little bit of background of how we actually do that uh, for this work. And so this is the only, um, the only math that I have in the talk. Um, this is just the, the, the Sersich profile. So this is a, um, a mathematical description of the intensity of a galaxy's light as a function of its radius. Um, and then built into it is, uh, is things like shape parameters uh, how flattened they are, et cetera. And so what we'll do is we'll, we'll uh, fit this, this function to the light profile of a galaxy um, to get actual raw numbers about the size, the, the, uh, the position angle, the ellipticity, et cetera. Um, and so we'll do this by, by detecting all the sources in the image and then masking the sources that we don't want to fit, fitting the, the mathematical model to it, 
generating a residual image, sort of you know subtracting our model from the, the real data um, and just seeing what's left. And then we'll iterate on that. We'll, we'll refit uh, we'll, or we'll, we'll mask um, all the sources on the residual image and then refit it and then continue this process until we've really all only modeled the galaxy light instead of, um, instead of stray stellar light that might be in the field. And so this is just kind of a, a simulation you can see in each iteration. Uh, in the top left here is the real data. In the, uh, in the right, uh, top right is a mask. It's bottom left is the model. And then the bottom right is the residual. And so playing this again, you can see how the residual starts um, quite messy in the middle because we're not modeling the galaxy properly. Uh, but as we continue, the residuals go away and it's like the galaxy was never there. And we can really trust that, uh, that our, our mathematical model is, is simulating these galaxies quite well. And so we did that with all of the galaxies in that field. Um, and we can start now doing real science with them and comparing to, to other galaxy populations uh, in, the, in the universe. And so this is what we call this, the size mass diagram or size luminosity diagram where um, the size is shown on the y-axis here, uh, and the mass is the bottom x-axis. Uh, likewise, the brightness is the, the top y-axis with brightness increasing towards the right. So you can see there's a lot going on in this figure, but um, I'm just going to break it down into sort of some of the basics that are, that are relevant for the talk. Um, and basically, what this, this, uh, uh, this diagram can do is really illustrate the different galaxy populations uh, that we find throughout the, the nearby universe. And so we'll start here with, uh, with giant galaxies. So this is just a, you know, a rough approximation of where giant galaxies lie on this figure. So they're very bright and they're very large. Um, meanwhile, uh, just off to the left, it's sort of intermediate masses, intermediate magnitudes. We have ultra diffuse galaxies, which are another really interesting type of galaxy. So these are galaxies that are the size of giants, the size of the Milky Way. Uh, but they only have as much light as your typical dwarf galaxy. So they're very, very diffuse and they're, they're a really interesting category, but, um, but I'm not going to talk about those really tonight. Uh, likewise, I'm sure all of you are familiar with globular clusters. So these, these lie in the bottom left of the diagram. So these are very, very compact um, and, and relatively uh, um, uh, faint objects compared to, to overall galaxies. Finally, we get to the three types of dwarf galaxies that I'm going to talk about. So here we have so-called sort of regular dwarves. These are very run-of-the-mill, and this is the, the majority of the type of dwarfs that we were finding in, um, in the Fornax galaxy cluster. So they're really just smack dab in the middle of this plot. Uh, below them, um, at similar luminosities, but much, much more uh, smaller sizes, are the ultra-compact dwarf galaxies that I mentioned before. And finally, in this region uh, are the ultra faint dwarf galaxies. So these are, these are like those galaxies where you couldn't even see them in the image. And so these are the, the three galaxies, uh, ultra faints, sort of run of the mill and ultra compact dwarfs that I'll, I'll speak out for the, um, <clears throat> talk about for the rest of the talk. So yeah, they're, they're, there you have it. So first, let's start off with uh, regular dwarfs. So these are, these are the most common type of dwarf that we know about. Um, as I said, they lie all over uh, the Fornax cluster. And so here's, here's the core of the Fornax cluster, just to remind you. Um, but there's a bonus in that we actually went even further out than the core uh, and took another ring of, of dark energy camera observations, uh, which led to this map of, of dwarf galaxies. And so what you're seeing is that dwarf galaxies really extend throughout the entire, um, uh, the entire galaxy cluster region. So they're a little bit more populous in the core as they're brought in by the giant galaxies that are being uh, uh, merged into the core of the galaxy cluster. But they really do extend uh, all the way to the edges of the cluster. And in fact, um, when you draw a surface number density map, so that's what's shown in, uh, in purple, green, and yellow here, uh, so this is just the, the, the density um, of dwarf galaxies that we observe across the field. So yellow are regions of very high dwarf galaxy density, and purple are where we don't find any dwarf galaxies at all. And so if these were brought in solely by giant galaxies, sort of on this hierarchical, hierarchical framework where the giant galaxies themselves are, are eating these dwarf galaxies while they're falling into the cluster and thus bringing their own uh, uh, populations in, 
then you'd expect that all the dwarf galaxies would be tightly clustered around the giant galaxies. So the giant galaxies here are these, these uh, orange squares. Um, but in fact, we actually see collections of dwarf galaxies uh, even where there's no giant galaxies uh, present at all. Uh, and so what this is telling us is that uh, dwarf galaxies themselves can form uh, their own building blocks before merging into giant galaxies. So they kind of pre-process themselves into their own sort of dwarf galaxy groups as they infall onto larger structures and they don't need to just be brought in by giant galaxies. And so again, this is just telling us uh, uh, more about how the largest structures in the universe form um, and we really don't have this information until we, we ma make the effort to really look for these, for these dwarf galaxies. Um, another interesting thing about this plot is that in the middle here, this big orange uh, square is the dominant galaxy of, of, the cluster, of the Fornax cluster itself. So this is NGC 1399. We were expecting to see a, a large peak of dwarf galaxies around this, this giant galaxy. It's the most massive, so it really should have the biggest reservoir of, of dwarf galaxies surrounding it. When in fact, we actually find a, a, a saddle point. This, this is a, a local sort of low density region um, where we find the higher re densities of dwarf galaxies um, uh, farther out from, from NGC 1399. Uh, this is still open to interpretation, but it may just well be that the intense gravity of, of 1399 actually tears apart the dwarf galaxies uh, in relatively short order and thus we don't actually observe the dwarf galaxies because they've already been absorbed into the 1399 halo. Um, and so plotting all those, uh, the, the total dwarf galaxies that we've found in the, the cluster so far onto the size magnitude diagram, you can see they really do strongly populate this central region of the size uh, luminosity diagram. Um, moreover, compared to, uh, to, to giant galaxies in the local universe, Numerically, they, they're just orders of magnitude uh, more populous than, than the giant galaxies, which is, again, what we would expect. So what, um, what you may have noticed on this plot is these, all these red points that are dwarf galaxies, uh, some of them have these black dots. So these black dots are referring to dwarf galaxies that have been nucleated. So uh, in their evolution, a lot of their, their gas is being funneled to the cores of the galaxies uh, triggering massive bursts of star formation that form these, these star clusters in the cores of, of the, the, uh, the dwarf galaxies. And so when you look at these, they actually have visible, uh, tiny but bright nuclei uh, embedded in their otherwise really diffuse and faint, uh, faint envelopes. And so that brings me to the next type of dwarf galaxy, my, uh, one of my favorites, uh, the, the ultra compact dwarfs. So as you might remember from the beginning of the talk, uh, I said this is, this is a bit um, not controversial, but uh, it's, it's a bit debatable whether these are actually galaxies or not in these, these ultra compact dwarfs. The reason for that is because um, in that size luminosity diagram, they kind of straddle the region between what we really know are just star clusters, like globular clusters, um, and the region where these dwarf galaxies lie. So they're they're almost as massive as a dwarf galaxy, but they have the sizes more similar to globular clusters. So these were discovered about 20 years ago um, in the Virgo and Fornax galaxy clusters. Um, and nobody really knew what to make of them at the time. Um, and there was a very uh, a hot debate as to whether we should really call these galaxies or not. Are these just really, really bright and massive star clusters? Or do they really have galactic origin? And so. Um, the debate is, has, is, has settled down a bit, um, um, and it's basically a mix. Uh, some of them are probably bright globular clusters, and others are, in fact, uh, coming from former dwarf galaxies. So the one I'm highlighting here, um, this is actual uh, uh, image of it here. So this is a, a M60 UCD1, so ultra compact dwarf 1, around the giant galaxy M60 in the Virgo cluster. Um, and... Uh, Sorry, like I said, that's, this, is, this is where they lie in the size luminosity diagram here. So here's globular clusters, dwarf galaxies, and these kind of have, are intermediate between the two. Um, and so getting back to, to how they might be of, of galactic origin, um, I mentioned these nucleated dwarf galaxies. Uh, so like I said, some of them, like this, this one imaged here um, and zoomed in here, you can see this really tight nucleus in the middle of this dwarf galaxy. 
we find a lot of these in the, 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 the Fornax cluster. And so what I'm showing here in the, on the left-hand panels are uh, non-nucleated dwarfs. So these are just re regular run-of-the-mill uh, diffuse faint dwarf galaxies where the real data is shown in the, the top row here. Our models are shown in the middle and then our residuals are shown in the bottom. Uh, the right-hand panels, on the other hand, are, are these nucleated dwarf galaxies. And so you can see in the real data, each one has this faint nucleus. And so when we only fit this, this faint, um, faint galaxy model, what we have in the residual is sure enough this, this, uh, these bright nuclei that are left over. So how does this relate to the ultra-compact dwarfs? Well, these are actually the origins for uh, many, many ultra-compact dwarf galaxies. And so it was debatable, it was, it was, it was supposed that, um, that what might give rise to these ultra-compact dwarfs is if you take a nucleated dwarf galaxy and throw it into a galaxy cluster, this is a really violent environment where giant galaxies are constantly tugging at the outskirts of these faint dwarfs um, in every which direction. And so as it travels through the galaxy cluster, it actually gets torn apart. So all of the diffuse material gets stripped off of it as it passes through the cluster. But the, if it's nucleated, then the nuclei is tightly enough bound that it can actually resist the, that gravitational stripping. And so this was an idea that was proposed for the galactic origin for some ultra-compact dwarf galaxies. But most of the evidence up till a number of years ago was really circumstantial. There was, there was definitely good, uh, good arguments for it, but there was really no smoking gun that a uh, UCD was really the, the stripped remnants of a former dwarf galaxy. But in 2014, there was a nature paper by um, Anil Seth who uh, took a, an integral field spectrograph. So this is a, this is a spectrograph that takes an image of, of your target, but instead of just having, um, uh, having pixels act as a light bucket, it actually uh, uh, disperses the light in the third dimension so that you actually get a spectrum at each pixel location. And so these are really, really powerful tools. And, uh, and Seth et al. Um, targeted this really bright ultra compact dwarf galaxy because they figured if this is of a galactic origin, so if this used to be a nucleated dwarf galaxy, then it should have a black hole in its center. Because as far as we know, almost all galaxies have these massive black holes. And so why don't we look for it? So how do we look for it? Is we look at the, the kinematics of the stars in the, the core of, of the, um, the ultra-compact dwarf. And so what you're seeing in this panel here, um, in these top two, these are the actual data from Seth's paper. And in the bottom is a, is a, a mathematical model, a dynamical model. Um, and so the model, they basically said, okay, what are the parameters of the ultra-compact dwarf as we, would, as we would image it just using photometry? Now, let's throw in a giant black hole and see what kind of effect that would have on the stars, because the central stars that are influenced, dynamically influenced by the black hole are going to heat up. They're going to move a, a lot faster than the, get, than the stars on the outskirts. And so sure enough, um, in these right-hand panels, you can see this peak. So the color here is indicating the average um, uh, spread in velocity. So if you just uh, uh, assume that the stars in the core have a Gaussian distribution of velocities, some are moving faster than others, uh, what is the dispersion of that distribution in velocities? And so that's what the color is indicating, where red shows a very, very high spread of velocity. So these are stars that are really uh, moving at various speeds and have been really stirred up by some strong gravitational influence. Um, so the bottom model, uh, the, the color bars here are on the same scale, by the way, so in the, the bottom model panel, you see this massive spike in the stellar velocity dispersion. And sure enough, they get an almost exact match to what they actually observed. And the only way that this can happen is if there's a massive compact object in the middle. And this is actually explained by a supermassive black hole that has to be driving the stellar kinematics in the middle of this <coughs> galaxy. And so the, um, the, the takeaway from this, the really big deal was that for the first time, this was a real smoking gun that ultra-compact dwarf galaxies, at least in part, really do come from nucleated dwarf galaxies that have fallen into these galaxy clusters, had all of their diffuse envelopes stripped, just leaving these bright, bright, bright cores left 
that kind of mimic star clusters. And so now, now that we know that these really can come from tidally thresh dwarf galaxies, they're another tool um, to, to look for how many dwarf galaxies must have been, or at least a, a, a floor to how many dwarf galaxies must have been stripped apart to, to give rise to the giant galaxies that, that we all know and love. And so once again, this, this seemingly um, star-like creature that, that kind of looks boring. It's, not, it's just not as flashy as, as the images that we, we all just love, but it really tells an important story. And it's a really important piece of evidence to help us understand the formation of these galaxy clusters and, and giant galaxies that, that make them up. And so finally, I'll, I'll move on to the third type of dwarf galaxy. Um, and these are the ultra diffuse galaxies. So these are so far only known around the local group. Um, you can imagine why. And that's simply because they are so faint and so diffuse that so far they're basically impossible to detect um, uh, unambiguously anyway outside of the local group. So these are galaxies that, um, again, the, the size luminosity relation, uh, they have sizes that are very similar to your normal dwarf galaxies, but they have masses that go, go down to the very smallest star clusters. So, you know, you're Think about a, a, a large open cluster uh, having, you know, just a few hundreds or maybe a few thousands of stellar masses to them. Um, these have the same masses as, uh, as these open clusters, um, but sizes similar to, to an average dwarf galaxy. So these are really mysterious objects. Um, how, how do they still exist? How, you know, open clusters gravitationally evaporate within, you know, a few tens of millions of years. Um, so how are these still bound in the halo of the local group where other dwarf galaxies have been torn apart? And it turns out that these are some of the, while being some of the least dense stellar systems in the universe, they're also among the most dark matter dominated. So they have so much dark matter in their halos that the dark matter acts as a scaffolding that holds the stars all together uh, because they just don't have the gravity to do it themselves. And so because of that amount of dark matter, they can orbit around the halo of the local group um, for billions of years and not be torn apart by the, the Milky Way or Andromeda's galaxy. And so what, this, uh, what makes them so useful is that they're, they're extremely old. Um, so we don't think that they've formed recently. These are probably relics of some of the first galaxies that have ever formed. So this makes them extremely useful tools uh, to understand the conditions of the early universe where most dwarf galaxies of their ilk have been torn apart in their, uh, in their host gravitational potentials. So these ultra-faint dwarf galaxies were reasonably uh, um, uh, recently discovered, at least in, in larger numbers, um, and are proving really useful tools to understand um, how, how galaxies and clusters and how the universe evolved. And so just um, a few images of of some of the dwarf or the ultra diffuse galaxies that are known. And as you can see, they're, they're really hard to convince yourself that they're really there. But um, as has been done with Segway 1 here, uh, on the left panel is the actual galaxy. Uh, but if you actually isolate um, through parallax distances or, wh or whatever um, distance measures they actually use, I'm not entirely sure. Um, actually isolate the stars that you know are, uh, are associated with Segway 1, you get this panel on the right. Um, and this, this is the galaxy. This, I mean, it's just this, this tiny, almost pitiful collection of stars, but unseen, they're all being held together by a massive amount of dark matter that allows them to survive in, in the galaxy's halo. And then likewise, here's Le, um, Leo A or A, um, and then, um, then another uh, Leo four here, um, just as some of the examples of the, the ultra faint, faint or uh, ultra faint dwarfs that, that we've seen. Um, and so where do they re reside in our halo? They're generally in the outside, which, which is not surprising um, because while they're, they're held together by their own dark matter, um, had they been closer into our galaxy, then they would have uh, experienced much, much stronger tidal forces and, and may not have survived. Um, I'm not entirely sure how close the, the more recent ones have been found, um, but just for, for some context, here's where Leo A, a and um, Karina reside uh, with respect to, to the local group. 
anyway, um, I'll leave it at that. Um, just you know, wanted to kind of introduce some of these dwarf galaxies, and and that um, there there really is quite a quite an assortment of different types. And uh, I hope that I've convinced you that uh, while they're not as pretty, and while they're not as you know jaw droppingly uh, astounding as some of the grand design spirals and these giant ellipticals that we see all over the place. Um, in fact, you know, even though this is this is one of my babies, um, you know, it's 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 ugly. Um, I, I hope I've convinced you that uh, that despite all that, they're they're really intriguing targets, and they're really worth um, worth the effort of of imaging and studying. Um, and so, yeah, with that, uh, I'm I'm happy to to take any questions. Dad, it's John McDonald here. Um, I just wanted to ask if you. I've been able to estimate it, it, if you were to add together the masses of all of those dwarf galaxies, how would it compare to the mass of the, the large galaxies? Oh, uh, fractions. Very yeah. small. Yeah, very small. Um, I don't have a, a number I can quote, but um, orders of magnitude um, lower than, than their host galaxies, typically. I wondered, because you, you made the comment that as you look for them, there's more and more of these small galaxies that we had, didn't know about before. And I just wondered how, you know, what the total mass might be. Yeah, I mean, the, the total mass, so you can uh, just back of the envelope. So in, in Fornax, for example, we found about 600. Mm -hmm. um, this is, this is uh, um, uh, uh, depth limited. So, you know, there's probably more faint ones that we haven't discovered simply because we can't resolve them or we just haven't gone deep enough. Uh, but out of those 600, they, they range in mass from 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 8. Um, and so if you add those up, add a couple zeros, then you get to you know, 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 uh, total stellar mass, um, which compared to a 10 to the 12 or 10 to the 13 mass um, galaxy cluster, um, or you know, 10 to the 10 to 10 to the 12 mass um, uh, giant galaxy, you can, you can begin to see that, uh, that what we're seeing still doesn't make up a, a really large fraction of the, the giant galaxy mass. Thank you. You mentioned the uh, globular clusters versus the galaxies, but is there fundamentally a, something that defines the difference or is it just simply when they get big enough and they have a black hole in the middle or? Uh, yeah, so um, it's a tough question to answer because it depends again on, on, on who you ask. Um, so typically, uh, galaxies will be uh, will have dark matter halos, um, or will have had enough star formation and enough mass at some point um, that they will have developed their own central black holes. Um, so that's kind of a, a zeroth order description. Um, moreover, uh, dwarfs will be gas rich, whereas uh, a globular cluster has has expelled. All of the the gas and and uh, and dust and stellar material that forms new generations. Mm -hmm. So, where, whereas a globular cluster will, after the the first supernova events, will blow all that gas and dust out, and essentially quench star formation. Um, most dwarf galaxies show at least some evidence for multiple generations of stars. So they haven't blown that that gas and dust out simply because they have enough mass to to keep it in. Mm -hmm. And so these are some of the the arguments that, that people have made to sort of define what is really a star cluster and what is a galaxy. Uh, Matt, uh, these dwarf galaxies, do they sh share the same morphology of regular size galaxies? Um, of giant ellipticals, uh, uh, again, to first order, yes. Um, but they're much, much more simple structures than, than your average spiral galaxy. Um, <clears throat> So you can see here, like this, this galaxy, it's very diffuse. It's, it's, very, um, uh, it's very smooth in its light, light profile. So there's, there's very little structure to it. There's no spiral arms. There's no bar. Um, you know, the best that we can really find generally, um, of course, this is all general, um, is, is sort of nuclear star clusters, where, where at some point that gas and dust is being funneled in the middle to generate these nuclei. And that's kind of the uh, the, the most structure that we really see in these dwarf galaxies generally. So that's the reason why they might be hard to uh, 
uh, be seen as galaxies then. Yeah, and they're just hard to detect. Um, they're really low surface brightness. Um, so it, it takes it takes this magical combination of having you know a big enough light bucket uh, and enough time to to integrate on and and with telescope time being so competitive, um, it's it's hard to convince an allocation committee to give you all this time just to look for them. Um, but this is where the dark energy camera really changed the game uh, because it has this massive three square degree field of view and it's on a four meter class telescope. Um, so that's, that's really what kicked the, the, the door down uh, for discovering these. Um, whereas previously, yeah, it was, just, it was just too hard and took too much time um, to look for something that you didn't even know really what, what you'd find. Great, thank you. You, it's really quite elegant, uh, the analysis of the structure of the Fornax uh, dwarf galaxies and how you found black holes at the center of them. Has that been replicated in the local group? Oh, that is a fantastic question. Um, so. First of all, I, I want to just reiterate that um, the, the black hole work um, was, was not mine. Um, I wasn't part of the team that discovered that. Um, so I don't want to, don't want anyone to want to give me credit for that. <laughs> um, so in the local group, um, we don't actually have any bona fide ultra compact dwarf galaxies. Um, there's a large debate as to whether uh, Omega Sen, which is the most massive globular cluster, um, that is debated whether that is in fact uh, a former dwarf galaxy core, which would make it an ultra compact dwarf. Um, but again, one of the things that we need to look for is the presence of, of a central black hole. Um, and there's been no definitive evidence um, to, to make the case for that. There is circumstantial evidence for intermediate mass black holes in some uh, globular clusters. Um, uh, as well as 47 Tuck uh, and, and Omega Sen. Um, but the problem is that they're, they're so, so nearby and the cores are so crowded, the, the stellar density is so high um, that we can't actually probe. It's, it's almost, it's, it's too close. It's too, too close to us to really be able to, to probe it the way that we can uh, ultra compact dwarfs at distance. So, you know, the, the answer to your question is um, is maybe, um, you know, <laughs> I, I wish I, I could could say it with more uh, with more gusto, but um, but it really is under debate. Some some people are convinced that these black holes are there and that something like Omega Sen is is an ultra compact dwarf. Um, I haven't really been convinced one way or another. I'm I'm just kind of on the sidelines, enjoying the the debate as it unfolds. I have a question about the black holes in the middle of the ultra compact ones. Yep. Uh, this might've been answered. I was away for five minutes. I was surprised to see that uh, the solar mass of the black hole you mentioned was a hundred billion solar masses in this ultra compact dwarf galaxy. How does, how does that relate to a regular black hole inside of a regular sized galaxy? And does the size of the black hole in the, ultra, in the compact one perhaps give a clue to how big the galaxy used to be? Absolutely. Um, so you did pick up on something that um, that I realized as I was talking was a typo. Uh, there was one extra zero on there. <laughs> it's actually 10 to the seven solar masses, not 10 to the eight. So the galaxy itself is on order 10 to the eight, um, but the black hole itself actually takes 15% of the total mass of the ultra compact dwarf galaxy, which is just unreal. That's um, this is, I mean, this, it was a really stunning result. Um, and to answer the second part of your question, um, the size of the black hole absolutely does predict what the mass of the host should have been. So there's, um, there's something we call the M sigma relation. So sigma is the velocity dispersion of the stars and M is the mass of the host galaxy. And I don't have an example um, uh, in my, my talk, but um, you can take my word for it that when you plot up the, the mass of the black hole um, as indicated by the velocity dispersion, it's a it's a proxy for the mass of the black hole. When you plot up that, that velocity dispersion as a function of host mass, it actually forms a very tight relation. Um, and so given a 10 to the seven solar mass black hole, looking at the M sigma relation, 
Um, I don't have a number off the top of my head, but you can absolutely look and, and, and infer what the, the mass of the host galaxy must have been um, before it fell into the cluster. Thanks. Well, thanks very much, Matt. And I, I want to congratulate you uh, for being a champion of the galactic underdog here. <laughs> and um, I, 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 it's really interesting stuff. And uh, I, I just wanted to touch uh, a bit more on your background and that uh, say that you had one, the courage to give up your day job to come in into this career, which is pretty extraordinary in itself. And then you went all the way down to Chile where you did not learn know how to speak Spanish <laughs> and you uh, managed to survive doing that as well. So it's an, quite an extraordinary tale and you're a, a wonderful example of a person having his courage to go out and follow his dreams. So I, I really uh, thank you for sharing that as well as your research today. My one question to you, uh, what sort of work are you working on at uh, uh, Hertzberg at the moment? Oh yeah, so I'm um, I'm still doing a lot of the dwarf galaxy work. Um, in fact, uh, this is around um, uh, Centaurus A, so NGC fifty one twenty eight. So this is a, an extension of the work I did for my thesis, where I studied the globular cluster population around the giant galaxy. Um, and now I'm I'm working on a paper describing um, very similar to, to Fornax, only much smaller in number, um, the the dwarf galaxy population around um, Centaurus A. Um, on top of that, I'm working on um, the kinematics of globular clusters in the Virgo uh, galaxy clusters. So we, we uh, obtained a, um, a five or 600 spectra of globular clusters in the core of, um, of the Virgo cluster. Um, and so this is a really fantastic uh, data set. So we have velocities, radial velocities of these, these globular clusters. And so we're, um, we're analyzing the kinematics of the, the globular clusters to see what they say about the buildup of the, the globular cluster population um, around one of those giant galaxies in, in Virgo. So that's, that's another thing that I'm, I'm working on. Um, as well, I just uh, I submitted a, a James Webb Space Telescope proposal. Uh, fingers crossed it gets time. Um, Good luck. That to study uh, some of the, the uh, black holes in uh, lower mass ultra compact dwarfs. So, so in all the uh, UCDs that have been, that uh, black holes have been detected in so far, they're all very massive um, because they're very bright. And that's, that's just what we're limited to with our current technology. But James Webb will be, go, be able to go down to much, much fainter magnitudes. And we can start really doing demographics about which ultra compact dwarfs have these black holes and which don't. And thus, which are really stellar cluster in origin and which are, are dwarf galaxy in origin. Um, and that'll, that will inform um, uh, sort of everything that I've, I've already talked about. So that's uh, kind of what I'm working on on these days. Well, the web satellite's uh, scheduled to launch on Halloween. So we'll think of you at our Halloween party uh, and hope it goes well for you. Yes, hopefully it goes well for everybody. <laughs> yeah. Now, just uh, the other thing you mentioned that uh, the scope that you used down in Chile was called the dark energy scope because of the the wide field of view and the uh, the instrumentations they ha they had down there. Do they have an equivalent telescope in the northern hemisphere? Um, there are four meter class telescopes in the um, in the northern hemisphere. Um, so the the telescope that I used was actually called the Walter Bad telescope um, after Walter Bad. Um, and then the the uh, the dark energy camera is just the prime focus instruments on it. Um, it really is a one-of-a-kind instrument. Um, so while there are four-meter class telescopes, um, CFHT is, is one of them in, in Hawaii, um, there's really no equivalent optical, you know, truly wide field imager um, in the Northern Hemisphere. The, the thing that comes closest would probably be Megacam. That's, that's on the Canada-France-Hawaii telescope, uh, which is about one square degree um, in, a, in a square footprint rather than kind of a, a circular one. Um, so yeah, the deck cam, the dark energy camera, really is a, a really unique and powerful instrument that uh, that I was lucky enough to use as a as a student. Okay, excellent. Are there any more questions for Matt? I've got a quick one. Uh, if if you have a dark energy or dark matter camera, I forget what you said. How does it work? Because you can't see it. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's um, that's a question I, I I probably can't answer well. So the the dark energy camera was specifically designed for what's called the dark energy survey. Um, so this is headed up by I think University of Chicago, but there's a whole consortium um, of of institutes behind it, um, and. It was essentially uh, designed to do this, this multi-year dark energy survey um, to look for, I believe it was supernova type 1a, uh, to get an understanding on the expansion of the universe and thus the nature of what dark energy is. So even though it's called the dark energy camera, it's a bit of a misnomer because it's not actually taking pictures of dark energy. Okay, okay. Um, it's just the, the data that it's presenting is, is meant to, to inform it. Okay, well, thanks again very much, uh, Matt, for, for taking the time to share uh, your uh, history and your uh, passion for astronomy and your uh, research. We really enjoyed it, and I wish you well, and uh, hope you, you make some major discoveries while you're at Hertzberg there. Well, thanks for having me. It's, um, it's a pleasure. Hope to hear from you again. Thank you very much. Sure you will. Thank you. Thanks. By the way, hi, Jim. <laughs> Well, you're, you're welcome to stay with us. Uh, uh, the next uh, talk is going to be about uh, a new book that uh, uh, came out uh, this weekend, I guess. Or, and um, uh, Chris Gaynor, uh, Victoria Center's very own Chris Gaynor is the author of this book and it was uh, funded by a NASA contract. Um, Chris, do you want to say anything about that? You're, you're muted, Chris. I am muted, so not anymore. Uh, I got uh, I got quite a charge out of uh, uh, Matt's uh, uh, the, the humor in his presentation, and uh, you know uh, this this uh, this reminded me of uh, 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 of something in my my background, and I'm just going to show you something. Where can I find this? Uh, just a minute here. Uh, where is it? Okay. I'm trying to do a share screen and uh, it's not showing what I wanted to show. Just give me a minute here. Okay. So my, my background is, uh, is in the, uh, is in the, the, the history of uh, space exploration. And, uh, you know, when I think of, uh, I'm, I must say, when I think of galaxies and, uh, you know, of course, the, the uh, many uh, collisions involving galaxies, uh, it kind of came up like this picture here. I don't know if you can see it. <laughs> but this, is, this is a collision that took place in 1960 between an Atlas missile and a, uh, Forward galaxy, <laughs> which uh, which I came across a few years ago, and it's it's of course one of my favorite pictures, and uh, 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 and uh, uh, I, I was very glad that uh, uh, galaxy this type of galaxy came up in my favorite uh, Star Wars picture, which of course is space balls. But anyway. Uh, uh, this is just offered in the spirit of the, you know, the uh, the, the the humor that uh, that leavened uh, the, uh, Matt's uh, Matt's presentation. So, I, uh, I I I got the impression when Reg contacted me today that that, that he, he he wanted me to say a few things. So, does it, do you see this here? Uh, my uh, my slide here, or do you? No, you have to share a screen again, I think. Okay, just hang on a minute here. Uh, um, one thing I'm not wild about in Zoom is that they don't all, the, it's not always uh, obvious when you're, when you're sharing a screen. And uh, so how does that, how does that look? That's great. So this is just going to be a short thing. It's kind of different from, from my usual, uh, my usual presentation, because I think most of you have seen my presentation, because when I started working on this book in, in 2014, 2015, 
I was automatically assumed to be an expert on the topic, which I wasn't. And I was terrified, actually. Um, and uh, uh, but I was expected to start giving talks uh, about Hubble and, and, and including several at the Victoria Center. And uh, but I just thought I'd uh, I, I'd walk you through a little bit of the his, history of, of, of my uh, my book and uh, and my studies. And again, this is this is a little bit like uh, like Matt's lecture because he was uh, telling us a little bit about himself. Uh, and uh, uh, like I said, uh, I kind of started off as a historian of space exploration. That's actually been my big interest in, in my the first book I wrote which came out 20 years ago almost, uh, was about how Canadians uh, who were involved with the Avro Arrow uh, lost their jobs when the Arrow was cancelled and wound up helping to put uh, Neil and Buzz and a few other people on the moon in my book Arrows to the Moon and I think I've given a few talks about that. Uh, more recently, uh, I uh, got my uh, PhD in history, and it wound up being about how the United States uh, came to get uh, the uh, Atlas missile, which you see at the at the right. And of course, that was uh, uh, the Atlas was featured in that collision with the uh, Ford Galaxy. Uh, but that's another story. Um, <clears throat> while I was working on on that book very early, I was still living in Vancouver. And uh, a, a friend of mine in Vancouver named Barry Shanko, and actually one of the great, you know, we, uh, we all um, have had to deal with the, uh, some sadness and tragedy in 2020. And uh, one of them for me was that my friend Barry passed away early in the year, but for a long time, he did the speakers at the Vancouver Center and he, he became a very good friend of mine. Uh, one day, Barry said, um, I want to go up to the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory. Uh, and I want to see, they, they apparently have the uh, data archive for the Hubble Space Telescope there, all of which was news to me. I'd been to Victoria a few times. Uh, mainly uh, to, to go down to the great rock pile downtown. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd seen the dome, but I had never been to the uh, DAO. So uh, in March of 1994, I took Barry up to the DAO and we met a fellow named Dennis Crowdtree, who showed us the Hubble archive there, which I knew nothing about. And, um, and so that was... Uh, uh, I didn't realize that the, that that trip was the beginning of a bit of a journey for me. Um, anyway, uh, very shortly after that, I moved to Victoria and wound up working at the rock pile until uh, until that great day in 2001, when when the voters had their way with the, the government I was working for, and I had to go and do something else. So I went to. Uh, I went to school, I got a, a master's degree in space studies at the University of North Dakota. And you see me there on graduation day with Dr. Stephen Johnson, who is uh, one of my academic mentors. Uh, uh, he's written a lot about the history of space exploration. Uh, there was no job immediately on offer, so I decided to keep on studying. So I went to the University of Alberta, although uh, I was able to do a lot of that work uh, while remaining here in Victoria. Uh, and uh, I, I uh, studied, uh, uh, I got my PhD in the history of technology uh, with uh, Dr. Robert Smith, who you see me uh, here in this picture when I graduated 10 years ago. Um, now, Dr. Smith is, is uh, a famous his, historian of astronomy. He's uh, written he's written perhaps a definitive book on the so-called great debate of a century ago. He also wrote the definitive book about how something called the Hubble Space Telescope was uh, built and created. Um, now, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, my uh, uh, my dissertation was actually about the Atlas missile. But anyway, uh, uh, 
shortly after I graduated, uh, uh, a bunch of people at NASA decided we need a history uh, of the Hubble to follow up where uh, Dr. Smith's book had left off. And, uh, and people at the DAO, you know, through my friends from the, uh, uh, through the RESC and a couple of them are here, said, well, I should, I should work on that book. And uh, I needed to be prodded into it a little bit. But anyway, I, uh, I decided to take the plunge and go after that contract and there was a competition and I won it. But the picture at the, at the right uh, is me in the uh, Hubble test article at the Air and Space Museum in Washington, which was taken about 15 years ago while I was working on my studies. And it kind of uh, made me feel, that's kind of how I felt compared to Hubble, that this was a big, big topic I was taking on. But anyway, in uh, 2014, on Halloween as it would happen, on uh, 2014, I got a, uh, an email saying that I had uh, uh, won uh, the competition against some, uh, against some good competitors, I think. And so I went down into my basement and, and, and even though I, I never expected that I would be uh, involved in any way with the, the Hubble telescope other than just being a, you know, an enthusiast like most of you, uh, I went into my basement and started poking around and what Hubble stuff do I have lying around? And the picture at the left is what I found. You know, several books I even had a schematic that Barry had given me in crests and stamps and, you know, various other things, you know, uh, videos and DVDs. So that's, uh, that's kind of how I started. So uh, uh, part of the, the, the contract, I was not working alone. Uh, I was working with this fellow uh, here called uh, uh, John Ruley, who actually comes from Modesto, California. And he, I never met John. This picture was taken at the AAS uh, six years ago in Seattle, uh, where I kind of really started work on this. Uh, and uh, uh, and John, uh, or as part of our proposal, um, we uh, NASA not only wanted a book, they wanted an archive. So all the information I collected, the interviews, the documents are available on an archive. And John came on board as the archivist. He had been in the same program as I had been in, in North Dakota, but at a different time. And uh, Dr. Johnson, who you saw on one of the pre preceding slides, put us together, even though we didn't know each other. And that's when my proposal for NASA became feasible because I couldn't do the whole thing on my own. And John, uh, was able to do the archive. And he actually also brought in this firm called Foresight Technology that was gonna be able to handle all of bureaucracy with NASA uh, while I was working on this contract. Because in some ways the bid was kind of put out like they put out a bid for a system or a spacecraft part. And, and all that bureaucracy, I don't know or care about, uh, but Foresight was able to handle it all. So, uh, so we went to work and, and uh, this, is, uh, this is kind of some of the, some of the things that, that, uh, that were asked for uh, when, when, I, uh, when I started on this. They've also asked for articles and I've, I've done some articles in various publications. I'm actually working on now one now. Uh, I think as most of you know, I did write a, a brief section in, in the book about the the uh, the time that uh, the the time on Hubble was made available to amateur astronomers, and I'm writing an expanded version of that, which is going to go in the Journal of the RESC probably later this year. I'm working on that right now, um, and uh, of course the book kind of picks up from uh, from Doctor Smith's book, which is you know quite uh, you know I think considered something of a masterpiece because he talks about some of the political forces that led to the creation of Hubble. But his, his book uh, kind of, uh, it was actually 
uh, completed before Hubble was launched in 1990, although uh, the paperback version does have, uh, uh, you know, an epilogue about uh, some of the things that uh, happened after Hubble was launched. Um, so anyway, in uh, 2015, I headed on down to the Goddard Space Center and, uh, and met, uh, met uh, some of these, these people who, who uh, helped me out through, throughout the, uh, the, the uh, writing. So I'll just kind of go left to right. I think you know the guy at the left. And then uh, in, the, uh, in the background uh, next to me is, is Ted Gull, who, uh, who is a, an infrared astronomer. And I think Jim knows all these people. In the in, and and uh, and uh, uh, Ted is uh, retired while I was working on this, but uh, we keep in we keep in touch. In the in the front in the center there is Ken Carpenter, one of the project scientists at Goddard, and uh, and then uh, uh, behind him, oh my God, I've just had a a, a, a brain seizure. Um, uh, she's the, the project scientist at, uh, at, at Goddard now. Um, <laughs> uh, I've just forgotten her name, uh, but she's, uh, do you remember, Jim, what her name is? Um, not at the moment. Your pardon? Sorry, not at the moment. Yeah, anyway, um, anyway, her photo is in the book. Uh, Patty Boyd is in the front. She, she actually, uh, she actually worked, uh, is one of the one of the, the scientists at Goddard, and she works on uh, um, the. Uh, she was uh, involved in the high speed photometer, which of course was one of the. Uh, she was kind of the person I talked to about what that was like, and the high speed photometer, of course, was the instrument that was sacrificed for the uh, uh, for the co-star on uh, on Hubble. And then at the right is Jim Gilletic, who is the deputy project uh, manager, and uh, he kind of kept things on the uh, on the uh, on the, 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 the straight and narrow. And I apologize for the, the seniors' moment here, but anyway, uh, these are all great people who helped me out. And uh, and then of course I spent a lot of time here at uh, at the. Uh, uh, Space Telescope Science Institute in uh, in Baltimore, and this is uh, a, a picture of me with my friend Ray Villard. And uh, I've known Ray for a long, long time because of my friend Barry. I met him in 1994 uh, because uh, Ray would come up to uh, the Vancouver Center and speak all the time, and. Uh, uh, and he actually gave me a tour of the uh, Space Telescope Institute in 1996. And uh, I thought that would be the only time I would ever visit the place. And uh, fortunately, I was very wrong. But uh, anyway, um, I hope he's still friends after he reads the book. <laughs> Although I, I think I, I, I quote him quite a bit, but I don't think I said anything uh, that he wouldn't like. But. Um, so anyway, uh, I had a, a lot of fun uh, uh, traveling around and meeting people. Um, got, got up to, John and I went up to Mount Wilson one day um, in California and we went down to JPL. Uh, and then, uh, then I, uh, one trip I went down to Florida and, uh, and visited this, uh, I think that's the shuttle Atlantis there behind me. And then uh, at the, uh, and of course I was at Goddard many, many, many times and uh, they were processing uh, the uh, JWST uh, while I was there. And that's actually me uh, behind JWST in the viewing window uh, on one of, one, of the, uh, one of my visits to Goddard. I would always make sure that I'd run over to building 28 to see how JWST was doing. So, uh, uh, I think now it's uh, either in California or on the way to the launch site. Uh, I guess it's still in California right now. And, uh, and then uh, did a lot of interviews with people in various places. This is me with, at, uh, at Stanford with uh, Bob Kirshner. And uh, now Bob Kirshner is actually a Harvard astronomer. Um, 
but uh, he was uh, he he was at Stanford for a year, and so I, I met him there. And then I had to sit down in my office and and start to write write the darn thing. And uh, um, and uh, and so that's the desk where I'm sitting right now, and, and wrote the book. And actually, right right behind my posterior, you'll you'll see a bookshelf, and. Uh, and uh, full of books and documents uh, uh, around uh, about Hubble. Actually, at that time, I had this this whole set of uh, of notes that uh, uh, one of the uh, people who was involved in in sorting out Hubble's vision problems worked on. And but I later took them back to the states and put them in the uh, uh, they're in the archive at Goddard. So anyway. Uh, finally, uh, last week, uh, this book uh, was uh, made available in electronic form, and um, and I think uh, uh, Reg had a slide with the uh, URL to uh, to get that book. It's available free in various ebook formats. In a couple of, uh, uh, I suspect it'll be about. Uh, a couple of months before the uh, the hardback version is available. Now it's a NASA document, so it's going to be a, a little bit different uh, getting copies um, uh, for it because uh, it being a government document, um, it's not necessarily something you can just order off of Amazon. But I've actually been thinking about how how we can make it available. Uh, without too much hassle for people up here, and I'm going to uh, work on it. I have to talk. I have to talk to some some people, and and when uh, when it's printed, uh, I hope to have a means to make it available. And perhaps um, when the uh, pandemic clears up, we can have a bit of a celebration and maybe uh, a, a proper. Uh, book launch, but uh, uh, actually uh, the official date it was uh, uh, put out uh, publicly was Friday, and a couple of hours after it went out, Ken Carpenter uh, uh, said, "Well, I've uh, <clears throat> a, a friend of mine wanted an autographed copy from me, you know, because of course Ken is quite involved in it, uh, being a project scientist, and." Uh, and he uh, 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 he uh, he he said, "Well, can you figure out a way to autograph it?" And uh, and I did. So I have actually done one electronically autographed copy for somebody in the United States. So uh, anyway, I'm hoping uh, I'm I'm hoping uh, that there will be some real ones. And I just thought it's Jennifer Wiseman. Who is uh, actually a, 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 a wonderful uh, scientist, and she's done a, a great deal. Uh, she's been a great spokesperson for uh, for for Hubble. So anyway, that's 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 my little spiel. I just thought I'd tell you a bit about this background because uh, you know you you you've seen sort of my a few times I've given the the talk about. Uh, you know what I what I say in in the book. So thank you. Well, thanks very much, uh, Chris. I appreciate you giving us the background there. It was a huge task. You must have a feeling of uh, both satisfaction and relief by now. I would think is that uh, is that an accurate assessment? A lot a lot of relief because I I was supposed to produce that in uh, three years, and actually most of the work was done in three years, although uh, then it went to kind of revision and review by various people. And there was a delay while people were deciding who was going to print it. And that, for a book uh, with all that information in it, that was very ambitious. And when I started out, I was quite apprehensive about whether I was going to be able to pull it off, but I think I did. Um, you know, it might if I if I had more time, it might have been better. But I, 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 I uh, so far the mo most of the feedback I've gotten has been fairly positive. But I guess uh, 
you know, a couple of things, you know, it sort of tells the story, I think, for the general public. But part of it is that this book is part of NASA's, uh, NASA's institutional memory. You know, this is for people who come along in the future or, or maybe new to the new to the project and say, well, why is it this way? Why are these instruments on Hubble now? And those instruments were on it, you know, 30 years ago. And, uh, and why is the control center here? And why is the Space Telescope Institute the way it is? And very, various other things. And I, I've, sort of, I've sort of tried to answer as many of those questions as I can. And an important part is, is the archive, is gathering this information because, you know, 30 years ago, we didn't have the internet. Uh, I had to do some, some, some digging around, which wasn't always easy. Um, and, and somebody is going to have to come along and, and consider this history again, you know, because Hubble is still going, you know, it's conceivable that the most important discoveries that involve Hubble uh, are yet to be made. You know, they could be sitting in the archive or, or it may not have made the observations yet. And of course, um, either, there's also the whole thing that, uh, which I sort of try and, and say in this thing, it, uh, you know, a lot of people think, well, Hubble is astronomy. And of course, uh, Hubble is just one of a whole bunch of uh, uh, different telescopes on Earth and in space that, that are involved in a lot of its, uh, its discoveries. So uh, anyway. Very good. Well, thanks very much, Chris. I, I, I'm a notorious person for skipping forwards but I read the foreword of your book and it was written by a NASA administrator and I thought it was going to be a bureaucrat, but it turns out is a, he was also being a NASA administrator. He was an astronaut who helped launch the, uh, the Hubble out of the uh, space shuttle and he had a story to tell. So I encourage people to read that. I found it very interesting as well. So uh, just a terrific job. Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay. Chris, yes. can you talk about the title? Not yet imagined. So, um, well, that, that was a, a title I thought of. And, you know, often, uh, often those are decided, uh, titles are decided by the publishers or, or, you know, people who support the book. You know, I've, I've written um, six books and only two of them have titles that uh, that I chose, but and and th this being one of them, uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, so not yet imagined. Uh, th this was a, a a phrase used to kind of describe what the hopes for Hubble. Uh, it uh, Hubble, uh, kind of the founding document of Hubble in a sense, or space astronomy. Uh, was uh, 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 Lyman Spitzer's 1946 paper proposing a telescope in space that he wrote in 1946. And he said, you know, such a telescope should be able to uh, search for phenomena not yet imagined. And then um, I came across that phrase again, uh, 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 John Backhall, who is one of the great astrophysicists of the 20th century. and also a driving force behind Hubble. Uh, he was a guy who kind of did a lot of the lobbying in Congress uh, and comes up many times in the book. Uh, he also used that phrase at the time Hubble was launched. And so I kind of, I kind of thought, thought that was apt because what has been found with the help of Hubble uh, are, are, you know, a phenomena in, 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 in astronomy that nobody expected, uh, not yet imagined. And, uh, you know, for example, uh, uh, um, you know, the information on the Hubble constant, which showed that the universe, the uh, expansion of the universe was accelerating, which was not what most people thought 30 years ago. Um, and various other things. So, you know, and that of course led to kind of the 
thinking about uh, dark energy. Um, but also that title is a bit of a sly allusion to some of the problems, the engineering problems that dog hovel. Nobody imagined when that thing was launched that the main mirror had this really fundamental and almost amateur defect in it and uh, that they had to overcome. So that's, that's where the title comes from. And I've called it a study. I didn't call it a history because, you know, we're still kind of, you know, midstream in, in the history. And so I just kind of jumped in and this is what things look like right now, 30 years after launch, but maybe, you know, somebody in 50 years after Hubble is, you know, uh, you know, uh, 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 is finished, uh, you know, might, might come up with some different ideas about, about Hubble. Great. Okay. Could you uh, please uh, uh, let me see the screen again? Okay. Okay. There we go. Thank you very much for that again. Uh, before we go, I just got uh, uh, one little thing, if I could share the screen here. And um, let's see. Try this. Okay, what I wanted to do, this is our Astro Cafe for tonight. First of all, the, uh, the link to uh, Chris's uh, book is, is here. And down here is a time sensitive thing. I got an email today from a fellow named Richard Bell from the Kalamazoo uh, Astronomical Society inviting uh, astronomy people to come to a five part introductory course in amateur astronomy via Zoom. And they've held this about eight times so far as a, um, a, a training course for uh, the people in the area. And this is the first time it's gonna be online. And uh, so I, I contacted him and he was very nice, came right back and uh, we clarified that it's gonna be starting on uh, Saturday, January 23rd at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And it'll be for five weeks. And if you click on uh, this link here, it'll show you the content of it. And the reason I mention it uh, is that one, I think, They've already got 200 people signed up for it. And uh, the probably is the uh, registration might go quick. And I know that there have been a number of people have been talking about possibly getting a, a beginners group for our SIG. And, and I know that we have some uh, media nationally about uh, uh, amateur astronomy uh, introductions and this sort of stuff. So I just thought that some people might want to uh, uh, check that out at any rate. And with that, uh, I'll stop the share and uh, uh, we're, we're pretty much done there. So um, anybody else have anything to add? I want to say that this was a wonderful evening. Thank you. It was a great way to kick off the, uh, the new year with the uh, great talk by Matt and, and the uh, the, uh, the positive announcement about uh, Chris's book. Uh, well, it's great to see everybody here again. And uh, next week will be our kind of traditional, more relaxed format uh, for the uh, Astro Cafe. And I hope to see you there as well, uh, again as well. And thanks again to Matt for uh, uh, g giving that great presentation. We really enjoyed it. You're here. Thank you. Thanks, thanks everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you.